Shalom and uh, welcome to today's Middle East Report. In this program today, we'll be discussing how one Christian organization is helping to save children's lives in Israel and also being part of that reconciliation and peace movement. Uh, sorry, can I start that again? Nearly had it, nearly had it. Thank you. Thank you. Shalom and uh, welcome to today's Middle East Report. In this program today we'll be discussing how one remarkable Christian organisation is helping to save children's lives in Israel and also playing their part in helping to bring about reconciliation between Israel's... Oh, sorry. I'm really rusty. You thought I was rusty. Thought you were rusty. Yeah, I'm very rusty. Okay. Nearly that. Thank you. Arab neighbours, that's all I've got. About. Yeah, that, that confuses things <laughs> for this occasion, but you're right, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I was to say, Israel's neighbours. Yeah. Shalom and uh, welcome to today's Middle East Report. In this programme today, we'll be discussing one remarkable Christian organisation that is saving lives in Israel and is also bringing about peace and reconciliation between Israel and our neighbours. And a warm welcome to the program. And uh, my guest today is all the way from the States. His name is uh, Jonathan Miles and is the founder and director of Shevet Achim. A uh, warm welcome to the program, Jonathan. It's an honor to be with you and with your viewers today. Pleasure. Uh, Jonathan, um, you know, you've got quite a remarkable background. Uh, you, you, you were born in the United States. Um, you also have a media background as well. Can, can you share with us um, your life uh, growing up in the States? I grew up in a strong believing home conservative Christian family, touched by the charismatic movement, uh, growing up with, uh, with joy and life in the church. I would say the further along that I went in my life, though, the more lukewarm and colder my heart was growing, Simon. I had, um, I had some issues of sin in my life that I never dealt with, that I was ashamed of, and, and the Holy Spirit would prompt me, talk to your parents, talk to your friend. I never, never was willing to do that. Uh, so I'm married, I'm into my mid-20s, less and less used to the Lord or anyone else, but starting to sense a little bit of the futility of that way of, of living. You might call it the normal Christian life in the West. Maybe a little lukewarm, a little compromise, but I, I knew there was more than that. One night I prayed, Father, I would like a life that means something for you. Reply, then confess your sins to your wife. Wow, that was hard but uh, he gave me the faith to do it. My wife showed the grace to forgive me. We were both baptized, went to study the scriptures to prepare for whatever ministry he might give us. And that's when my eyes were opened to Israel and the Jewish people, because when I really started getting into the scriptures, the Hebrew Bible, the prophets, for the first time in my life, uh, I began to be amazed and say, I'm reading about what's happening in our generation. Uh, yes, we're waiting for the return of Messiah and the intervention to set this world straight, but it's always set in the context of the regathering of the Jewish people to their land. And I, uh, I got excited that God's at work, he's intervening in the world, he's keeping his promises, and wanted to go and see Israel. Amazing. Uh, can you say also something about your media background as well, uh, and how that has played in with the, uh, the incredible work that, uh, that you're doing, and we'll hear about that shortly. Well, while I was still in uh, university, I uh, began working in uh, local television news and um, uh, started in, uh, as a sports reporter and then gradually broke my way into news and then into political coverage in the state house in New York State where I was studying at the time and uh, ended up working probably about five years altogether all in, in that field. 
Always trying to, to break the investigative story, you know, and bring some justice to the world, but uh, <laughs> just the wrong tools, I think, because it's the Spirit of God that brings forth the truth, that lays bare the secrets of men, and, and He wants to change our hearts and to, and to change this world. Absolutely. So can you share with us how the Lord led you to establish uh, Shevet uh, Achim and also explain what uh, Shevet Achim uh, means in Hebrew? Sure. Shevet Achim means, uh, it's from Psalm 133, which, Hinei matov umanaim Shevet Achim kam yachad. Many of us know that Hebrew melody. So when you hear the word Shevet Achim, you think, look how good and pleasant it is for brothers to live together in unity. Um, how did this get started? Uh, maybe a little bit of length, just because I think the context of this will be relevant to your viewers. Uh, when I went to Israel, in uh, 1990 for that first visit. I was excited, uh, wanted to see what God was doing. Did I have any role there? Toured the country, visited ministries, congregations. Actually felt like a complete tourist and outsider and nobody waiting for me to show up and how could I do anything effective in the Middle East? But one night I sat to pray and uh, just asked the Lord, is there something here for me? And again, I felt spoken into my spirit uh, something very clear and powerful. It was three words. Will you come? And that was it. But I knew it was our Father. Uh, and I don't have experiences. That's maybe the one time in my life I can say, I know the Lord spoke to me. Called up my wife. She agreed to come. Called my job. Quit. <laughs> she was expecting our fourth child and uh, a war was about to break out in Israel. Think of all the reasons many of us have to say, I couldn't go to Israel just now. Um, but it was so clear. I knew it was the Father. Uh, the next night, though, fears and doubts started to rush in. Uh, I was up in Jerusalem overlooking the Temple Mount, like this, the scene behind us right now, and uh, um, began to think, well, you know, you can't, you don't have a visa for Israel. You can't uh, work here. Uh, you don't have any money. You don't have supporters. <laughs> what, what are you doing bringing your wife about to have your fourth baby to, to Israel? Um, and the only thing that saved me uh, were the words of Jesus. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Your Father in heaven knows what you need and he will add all these other things to you. And I just had to say, right, I can't see how this could possibly work out, but if God is calling, I'm not gonna limit him by my own understanding. He has unlimited resources. He can do whatever he asks us to do. Or as people have said for, for centuries, where God uh, guides, he provides. <laughs> Absolutely. And, uh, and we came to Israel. And um, this was right at the peak of the uh, Aliyah, the immigration from the former Soviet Union. You know, one of the barriers to the word of God being performed was this system called communism, which had millions of Jews locked up, unable to, to leave um, the, the lands of the north there. And uh, Christians were praying and, and making prophetic actions, and incredibly, the doors opened. And uh, it's still not clear to me why that even happened. There, there was no obvious reason why the Spirit should have gone out of this communist system, but it did, and the Jews were freed. They'd been saying, let my people go, and finally they were free. So they're coming into Israel in vast numbers. I started working with other believers, Christian Friends of Israel, the Ebenezer Fund, uh, helping these immigrants to arrive and give them a little bit of support when they landed in the country. Simple message, we Christians have received everything that's dear to us from you, the Bible, the Messiah. Um, we believe God's at work in your people's life and you have friends in this world. We want to stand by you. Amen. Yeah. Wonderful time. Until one day a non-Jewish boy comes into that office where we were working and uh, his mother says, my son's dying. We came to Israel to try to save him. The hospital wants $64,000. We don't have any money. Can you help us? I was looking for the exit on that one because uh, that wasn't our calling. We had all these Jewish families, we'll make 100 families a day coming in. We're giving a little bit of help to each one. How are we gonna deal with this? And it's not even the Jewish people and I'm here to serve them. Um, so I say, let me go to the hospital and check this story out. Um, hoping to find out it's not true. I find the professor that afternoon. He says, it's true. This boy will die in two months. I think we can save him, but I have to tell you one thing. That child could be dying in the doorway of our emergency room and we won't let him through the door until the last dollar has been paid. That's not the way we like it. Every big medical center in the world, bone marrow transplantation is very expensive. 
But the, the honesty with which he, he, he spoke about this really struck me. And uh, we, we know in theory that there are kids in the world not getting medical care, but here was a beautiful boy. Here we had the treatment, he's in the doorway, and we're saying, out, it's not for you. How can we accept that? Um, is the world really divided like that between one child whose life is worth saving and another one we'd say, you don't matter to us because of your background or your financial status? Or in this case, if he'd been a Jewish child, he could have had citizenship, but he wasn't. Is that the God that we know from the Bible? Is he a, a respecter of persons? <laughs> Does he show favoritism or not? Next morning they come back in, I say, look, key moment. Look, I don't know how we can help you. But instead of just saying, let me pray for you before you go, and please don't come back. <laughs> I said, look, I don't know how we can help you, but let's pray. Let's see what God can do. Let's share your son's story. And, and this is important, let's give what little bit we have. Don't the scriptures teach us that when God's people give what little they have, God multiplies. Uh, five loaves and two fishes. Uh, a, a jug of oil and flour that never ran out. <laughs> I mean, God can do this. And it was amazing over the next month to watch how People from all backgrounds joined together. Jews and Christians, secular and religious, everyone agreed that boy deserves medical care. We can't just send him away. And the women of uh, Vizzo, the Women's International Zionist Organization, they, they made a big fuss with the management of the hospital. You've got to lower your cost and make it possible. And they did in the end. It was amazing. The professor said that'll never happen. You know, the hospital's too financially hard pressed. And when he got the word that they had agreed, he says, uh, how did you do that? I said, well, we've been praying. He says, no, really, tell me, what did you do? <laughs> this is amazing. And, and the beautiful thing was that boy um, got his bone marrow transplant within one month. And he got the message, your life is as valuable as anyone else's. You are equal. You are as loved. You are made in the image of God. He put his trust in God, went in, and had his treatment. And uh, soon we had opportunity going into the Gaza Strip to, to see that story multiplied over and over again. Uh, and especially to the neighbors of Israel. You know, go all the way back to the book of Genesis, uh, Ishmael thrown out of the camp. And that, that, that soul wound, I believe, is still very alive in the hearts and minds of the people in the Middle East. The feeling that you're out, you're rejected, you're second class. And you bring these kids into Israeli hospitals and the doctors embrace them and treat them with the best care in the world. They respect them. It's amazing. It's such a healing message for the neighbors of Israel to come in and experience that. Absolutely. So let's have a look now at uh, the work uh, that uh, Jonathan's involved in with... Um, sorry. Sorry, can I say that again? Sorry, Joe. Shevet Ashim. Shevet Ashim. Sorry. Shevet Ahim. Shevet Ahim. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let's have a look now at uh, the work that uh, Jonathan's involved in with uh, Shevet Achim. The name Shevet Achim is from the Psalm 133. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. Uh, basically we are uh, seeking to give life, uh, give hands, give, give lips to that, to that truth by caring about our neighbors who we don't see as, whether they're Muslims or Jews, we don't see them as a, a different category of people than us or a different religion or a different relationship with God. Uh, uh, we are brothers. We, we share the same need for God's grace. And uh, we have been confronted with the reality that uh, children in our region are dying without medical care. And uh, as a parent, I asked myself, what would I do if that was my child born with a heart defect? And very slowly turning blue and gasping and, and uh, ultimately dying if there's not intervention. And how would I feel watching that happen to my child, knowing there were hospitals so close at hand that could save them, that I was too weak and too poor of a father to get my child there? I can't imagine a worse, uh, a worse fate as a father than to be in that situation. Um, we're working with those medical centers. We found partners there, uh, wonderful doctors who are more committed than we are to uh, 
loving their neighbor's kids, to treating any child as a child of, of inestimable worth. So we find these kids, um, we get into relationship with them so that they can see our hearts and realize these are people who, who love us, these are people we can trust. We can go with them to a place that we would never think of going, uh, crossing barriers that we would never cross on our own, never dared to, to imagine that we could. Uh, we bring these kids from Iraq, from Syria, from the Gaza Strip, uh, from North Africa, anywhere in the Middle East, anywhere in the Muslim world. Um, bring them to Israel, bring them to the hospitals. Our work uh, is in the midst of a uh, uh, season of change right now. We began in the Gaza Strip with uh, Palestinian kids who, with the political changes in the early 90s, were uh, suddenly being left without access to medical care. Uh, next big change came uh, 2003 after the war in Iraq and suddenly a nation's uh, health care system was, was not functioning anymore and hundreds and hundreds of kids uh, in need of life-saving heart surgery is just being left there, no options. Uh, now the crisis in Syria, uh, we have been able, uh, praise God, we've been able to see that even those kids can cross the border into the the ultimate enemy state, Israel, and uh, and find that they're accepted and cherished by the medical staff here. So each, as the Middle East is in turmoil and things are changing, um, we're continuing to, to just be a steady uh, presence with this message, which says uh, all of us are of equal value in the eyes uh, of the Lord. So we want to invite people through our website, through Facebook, uh, through visits here, uh, be involved, feel a part of this community. We send out uh, prayer updates so that uh, folks can uh, be aware on a weekly basis how they could be, be, be praying for us. So, Ahlan uh, Sahlan, welcome to uh, all those who would like to share in the work of our community. We, we'd love to, to serve you and to equip you here. And truly wonderful and uh, inspiring work. Uh, Jonathan, very, very impressive video. Um, obviously, you're putting your journalistic talents to uh, good use, I see, which, which is great. Um, can you share with us um, what it was like going into Gaza in the early 90s? I think it started off with um, Arafat signing the Oslo Accords mm -hmm. in uh, the White House lawn in 1993, uh, followed by something known as the Jericho uh, Gaza Agreement mm -hmm. um, that uh, Arafat was not happy just having Gaza, he wanted uh, something else as well, so the Israelis gave him Jericho. Um, what was it like actually going into Gaza in the first time, being under the, uh, the, the Palestine, newly mm -hmm. formed Palestinian mm -hmm. Authority mm -hmm. under leadership of Yasser Arafat? You know, first of all, uh, I should say at the time, I, I thought uh, uh, that was the last place I wanted to go, and I, I was afraid to go there. Uh, think of the images you're seeing even uh, these days on your television screens, such violence and hatred and conflict, and, and no way we could go in there. But uh, some women I worked with went in, and they came out and brought these stories of tremendous isolation and a people so grateful that anyone would come in to be with them. And finally, they, they got me in there, and I was uh, just stunned by the realization that these open-hearted, lovely people uh, had probably never spoken face-to-face -face with a follower of the Messiah in their lives. And my view of the Middle East started to shift. You know, I was very Jewish, people-centered, serving them, God's restoring them. You know, all these other peoples are sort of an obstacle or, or <laughs> an adversary. <coughs> But you get in there and you see these lovely people and you start to say, wait a minute, this is an unreached people group. Uh, these are sons of Abraham. The Jewish people, Paul says in Romans uh, 9 to 11, they're loved for the sake of their fathers. Uh, I'm convinced that our Muslim neighbors are loved for the sake of their father, Abraham, and they're very much on our father's heart. And um, it's something you couldn't walk away from when you, when you realized uh, that nobody was going to them. And, Eventually, I was challenged by a friend to take my family and live there, and uh, 
We moved into a refugee camp, and I didn't speak a word of Arabic. I spoke Hebrew with the people there, if you can imagine. And um, they loved us. First night, we're in the refugee camp. Boom, boom, boom. Knock on the door. It's our neighbors. Not coming with hostility like I would have expected. Bowls of steaming hot food, fresh bread. And it continued day after day, week after week. The most generous people we ever lived with were the people of the Gaza Strip. Uh, they helped us and taught us more than we helped or taught them. Um, but I will say that so many of their kids, the new political agreements meant Israel was no longer taking responsibility for medical care, the new Palestinian Authority was. And too many kids were not getting referred out for life-saving medical care. They were just being left to die. And this is the reality in the Middle East. Everyone's talking about Gaza, Gaza, all these people groups. But a dying child who can be saved with a heart surgery, there's no one to do anything for them. The doctors in Israel, I read at that time about an Israeli surgeon who was starting to bring non-Israeli kids into Israel. And I called him up right away. What about Gaza? He says, those are just the kids we want to reach, but I can't get anyone there to talk to us. They won't pick up the phone. That's when I began to see, again, the Lord had prepared works for us that I didn't have any idea about. But this, this very feeling I had in the beginning, uh, I'm an outsider, what could I do here? That was my strength. Because I'm an outsider, I can go to Gaza. And I could bring these kids out. And that doctor, Ami Cohen, I have to tell you this. He said, uh, don't worry about money. Just bring us the kids. We'll worry about money later. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful spirit. Totally the opposite of where we started with that, that first child. And... Um, he just pushed us to bring more and more kids. And at the end of the year, we would sit down and, and look at all these commitments and divide them between us, and, and God provided. I still don't know how he does that, but he's done it year after year after year. We have relationships of trust and partnership with the Israeli hospitals. And what makes this possible, instead of adding to the cost for a, for a non-Israeli child, they now go more than 50% below the Israeli cost to help these kids who are in need in the region. And all they ask of us as Christian partners is help us with just enough so that we can, we can justify this to the administration of the hospital. And um, so, so much is happening for so little. It's an open door. Israeli doctors who, who take joy in laying down their own lives and giving up their free time to save lives of kids. But if we're not there, they can't do it alone. They can't reach these kids. They need, they need us to find them. They need a little bit of encouragement. They need a little financial support. Amazing. Uh, and Jonathan, have you seen um, a change in the attitude of, of the parents, uh, of the Palestinian parents who have uh, brought their children into Israel to receive uh, medical attention? How have their hearts changed through your organization and, and what the Lord is using you to do about bringing reconciliation between um, Israel and our Arab neighbors? Yes, it's... Um it's a wonderful experience when they get into these hospitals and for the first time they are treated as if they are of value. Uh, it's something they don't experience in their own, in their own culture. Uh, I think the Gaza families, we've been working more than 20 years and they're still coming every week. We're bringing Gaza kids. Even uh, during these days, so much violence, you'd say, there's no way kids are coming into Israel in the midst of all this. They're still coming. Uh, Israel has never blocked access for even one child in more than 20 years. Life-saving medical care, no question, they're coming. Um, the Gaza families, they know this now. It's been decades that Israel has been a lifeline for their medical care. Um, I think it's been more the Iraqis and especially the Syrian refugees who are coming into Israeli hospitals now. Uh, they've always been told Israel's the worst, worst people on the earth. They're your enemies. They're, they just want to steal, kill, and destroy. <laughs> and, uh, and they come and see just the opposite. They say, we've been lied to all, all these years, we've been told. And uh, actually, they're the only ones who care for us. They're the only ones who would do anything for my child. Um, I, I've seen transforming effect, um, not just politically, uh, Spiritually as well, I think. We had a Shiite father from Baghdad just in the last couple of months. Nobody would help. Nobody could help his son. And it was, uh, it was a Thursday afternoon when I met them by the bedside in the hospital in Iraq. And uh, the doctors were saying, this child needs surgery in two days if he's going to live. Well, what could we do? No way to get a visa to Israel and all that in two days. We prayed by the bedside. Uh, father, we can't do this thing, but 
you can do all things, would you open a way? We pray in the name of Jesus the Messiah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Next day is Friday. <laughs> okay, you know anything about Israel? Interior ministry closed. Nothing's going to happen. 22 minutes before the start of the Shabbat, I get a WhatsApp message from the head of the visa section in the interior ministry. And it just says, uh, where is he landing and when is he coming? <laughs> what? <laughs> you say, the interior minister has intervened personally and given permission for this baby, Shiite baby from Baghdad to land without going through the whole visa process. And the father was so blown away by that. He says, wow. I, I saw how you prayed and I saw what happened. And he came and his baby was saved. And uh, he also started reading the scriptures and learning about the Jewish people. And uh, he opened his heart. He, he, he said, there's no mistake in what I'm reading here. This is true. The Spirit of God touched him and opened his eyes. So there is transformation taking place. Amazing. Can you share with us um, your incredible first experience in Iraq uh, after the uh, removal of Saddam Hussein and his regime back in mm -hmm. 2003. I mean, surely that was at the time, and probably still is, one of the most, if not the most dangerous place to be on the entire planet. But mm -hmm. the Lord led you to Iraq. Can you tell us um, how you got to Iraq and how the Lord used you powerfully to help uh, save uh, Iraqi children? Yeah, we went in uh, right after the war in the summer of 03 uh, and see what was happening. Uh, talk about danger, I still remember, you know, I had my video camera and I wanted to document to show people what was happening there. So I'm hanging out the window of a taxi and here come the American troops and I'm, I'm filming them and they think, here's somebody pointing something at us. <laughs> and boom, they jump out in their training, I see these laser sights on me and whoosh, thank God they didn't pull the trigger. Um, when they figured out who we were, they, and it was okay. Um, same thing in Gaza. It was the IDF that uh, when we were ever at threat for our lives, because they were also very much uh, on, the de on the defensive um, towards, they'd been attacked so many times, and the Americans in the same way. Um, but God preserved, and he made a way, and uh, it, um, I didn't have faith that those kids from Iraq could really come into Israel. The medical system was destroyed, all these kids dying, desperate families. First, we took a couple to uh, Europe, to the States, a group of 20 went to India. I was afraid to even say to any families there, you know, you could come to Israel. But one day, a uh, two-day-old baby is laid on the desk in front of a U.S. Army doctor in Kirkuk, and I'm there. He takes out this battlefield device where they treat injuries, a sonogram device, and he says, she has transposition of the great arteries. She has to be operated on within two weeks to live. And he starts crying and he says, I see kids like this all the time and I can't do anything for them. This is the reality in the Middle East. No one is able to help these kids. And I'm looking at that and saying, how many times have I seen the doctors in Israel? If they could get their hands on this baby, they would give everything for that life. And it's another one of those key moments where if God will give us a gift of faith just to step out, we don't have to understand how it could happen. We don't have to have the resources. Just step out and ask God. And uh, I said, okay, all right, God, I'll, I'll go to the family and I'll, 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 I'll pluck up the courage and I'll say, well, if you would go to Israel. Went to their house. It's nighttime. All the men and the elders of the family are talking and talking. I don't know what they're saying. Finally, they look at me and say, Israel, no problem. <laughs> They were Kurds. I didn't know the Kurds at that time, but the Kurds are a Muslim people group in the Middle East, and we've been getting to know them more, haven't we? They've been in the news. Very open hearts towards the Jewish people. Where that comes from, all I know is the ten northern tribes, when they were taken away into captivity, they were taken to Kurdistan, actually, according to the Bible, and they grew up for millennia side by side, the Jewish people and the Kurds. And they're very open hearted towards the Jewish people. And uh, one, one barrier after another, just fall, fall, fall. Uh, this baby needed an emergency catheterization before she could fly. The, the uh, Iraqi cardiologist was a cousin of Saddam Hussein who had just been overthrown and he was hiding somewhere. Um, he said, no, no, she doesn't need it, let her go. And the Israeli doctor is saying, no, she has to do this. In the end, I just took my, my phone and said, you two have to talk. And uh, <laughs> so Saddam's cousin is talking with uh, the Israeli doctor and you know what I said about how saving a child's life brings people together you'd never expect? Lovely conversation of uh, how can we cooperate to save a life? They didn't talk about religion, they didn't talk about politics. 
Uh, it's a beautiful dynamic that's happening. Uh, amazing, amazing. Yeah. And uh, let's have a look now at uh, an incredible story uh, in which uh, Jonathan and his team has helped to save the life. And this is one particular story, and this is Aman's uh, surgery. Yesterday morning, Kyle and I went to Wolfson Medical Center to um, go to Ayman surgery and um, we arrived there around 7 o'clock. So after 15 minutes, the nurse from the ward called Ayman to the surgery and so we headed down to the OR preparation department. No in the moment was there where Ayman's father had to say goodbye to his beloved son and so he took a deep breath and just kissed his son on his head. And then I went together with the team into the operation room. When I went into the operation room, I was really excited and um, also a bit scared because I didn't know what I should expect. But after a while, um, a doctor came to me and he explained to me I could stand there and sit there if I like and I can take pictures. So um, I was very glad that he told me this and um, I just felt more and more that it is a unique opportunity um, to be present in this room and it is a huge privilege also to see the doctors. So after um, a while also the procedure was going on and I saw the doctors and um, all the other um, person involved. Um, all in all it was eight people or more in this room um, being part of the surgery and so I just I just want to say that it is um, um, such a privilege to be there and to see how many people are caring for such a small little um, boy who had to have a surgery for correcting his heart defect. In the end I um, felt much joy and I felt that God gave me a lot of joy when I saw that the surgery was completed and um, they took him off the big um, bypass machine and his heart was beating again by itself. So. Um, I saw him laying on this small table and I was just glad to see that everything went well and that the doctors were satisfied and um, yeah, I just thank God for this amazing day. A few minutes later, two doctors and I went up with baby Ayman on um, a bed to the ICU where Ayman's father and Kai were waiting for us and it was such a beautiful moment when we um, rolled the bed into their direction and we could see Ayman's father waiting for his son. Um, who he didn't see for four hours and they rolled him directly into the ICU and um, told Kyle and Iman's father that everything went well and it, they were really satisfied with the results of the surgery. And there, a wonderful and very special story uh, regarding baby Iman. Um, uh, Jonathan, uh, so impressive, uh, and I, I love what the Lord's called you to do and, and what you're doing, but how have the Israelis responded? Because there's something in the Jewish character, in their DNA, that just loves to help people. I mean, you know, these are children of their enemies that mm -hmm. are taught to kill them, to embrace terrorism against them, and yet the Israelis bypass that and just do everything they can to, to help those in a in a very dangerous or mm -hmm. even um, mm -hmm. life-threatening situation. Mm -hmm. You know, Simon, we, we're a community that uh, affirms that uh, God chose the children of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, uh, a chosen people. And, uh, but we understand that is not chosen as an end to themselves, but chosen to be a blessing to all the families of the earth, as Abraham was told right in the beginning. Um, so there is something in the Jewish people that responds with such joy when they walk in that calling and destiny. People ask me, oh, are these doctors uh, believers? Actually, most of them are, are, don't even know if there's a God or not, uh, the ones that we work with. Um, and yet, it's unmistakable, uh, the life that flows out of them when they walk in the very thing that they were called to do. Uh, and, and we have this opportunity just to provoke and, and draw them into this a little bit, to support them in doing it, and they light up. And there are commandments in the Torah, uh, love your neighbor as yourself. Love the stranger because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. And even the command of uh, Yeshua, Jesus, uh, love your enemy. There's something in them that, uh, that those words bring life to them. And uh, 
they end up, you know, in the, in the end, they're so much more committed and sacrificial than we are. Uh, I have to make this clear. Our part in this whole story is this big, <laughs> and the doctors are this big, and uh, they're giving up their lives uh, to love even their enemies. It's an amazing thing to see. Amazing. Uh, and, and Jonathan, can you also share how uh, you've been able to help uh, many of the Iraqis, um, Christians in living in Iraq and Syria, uh, and also the Yazidis who have faced um, unbelievable persecution f from ISIS? Mm -hmm. How have you helped uh, those children? You know, this, this gives some insight into how it is that God works in this world, because when you saw the Islamic State come sweeping through the, the Middle East and into Iraq, everybody said, oh, this is a disaster. This is terrible. But, uh, you know, God works through things like that. He works through hard times. Isn't that true of our own Absolutely, lives? Yes. Um, so what happened for, for both the Yazidis and the, the Christians from uh, the Nineveh province? Uh, you know, they were, they were pushed out of their comfort zones and their isolation in some ways. A lot of them had to flee to the Kurdish areas where we were already working. And um, that brought them into contact with this channel to come to Israel. And uh, we, we hardly saw a Christian child for our first 10 years. But once ISIS came, we've had uh, at least a dozen Christian refugee kids come out to Israel. And uh, same for the Yazidis, so many Yazidis coming out. And uh, the message across the board is the same. It doesn't matter that you're a despised minority uh, in the Middle East and in your own country. Here, you are valued and your life is the same value as any other child's. Amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, um, you've been very much involved in uh, helping also uh, Syrian refugees as well mm -hmm. uh, with mm -hmm. the ongoing uh, civil war in Syria. Uh, how have you been able to help in this situation? Because it's been very difficult for humanitarian aid agencies to actually do anything or anyone to do anything. Right. The good thing that's happened there is uh, the Syrians have, have had to flee Syria in the millions. And so many have come into neighboring countries uh, where we, we can have access to them. And, uh, the challenge there is they don't have papers, they don't have passports. And again, it was, a, it was a step of faith. Can a child really cross the border into Israel without a passport? And uh, we found that with God, all things are possible. And all kinds of people, will, again, will come together. Uh, all kinds of players, uh, Arab countries, Red Cross, working together because that child's life is at stake. Um, I think you have a video of one child, Ahmed, um, it's a perfect illustration because this boy was just on the verge of dying in a hospital in the country that was hosting him. And um, we, we found the mom and the child by the bedside of the hospital, prayed, bring that child back safely to this mother's arms. Watch what happened. There you go. Uh, Jonathan's mm -hmm. just introduced this uh, remarkable and uh, powerful story. So let's see it for ourselves.
So we have this gift as a remembrance of the the, uh, the love of God that was in our midst between us during the three months they were here. Would you? <laughs> Very nice. It's an amazing likeness, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Very beautiful. Who drew it? This is Danny's work. Okay. Okay. Israel. السلام عليكم مبروك مبروك ألف مبروك كيفو موهيلو ما شاء الله تبتذكري ما أحمد سلينا الرب يجيبه بسلام وهاي جواب الرب الحمد لله سلامة أبسطين what a testimony um, incredibly powerful inspirational just shows you how mighty and powerful our God is um, Jonathan uh, I, I think that will pull many of our viewers heartstrings it certainly did with me um, what was your reaction when you see um, prayer answered like that in the most amazing way obviously this is what you live for this is what you do but, but, but even when you saw that video you, you were getting emotional you know, Simon, the truth is we're, we're like the uh, children of Israel. We see God do amazing deliverances, and a few days later we, we think we're on our own again and we have to figure out things on our own. So uh, I keep having to learn over and over again, uh, trust the Lord. Um, he is still active and intervening and in answering prayer. Don't try to do things in our own strength. Pray and seek the Lord and let him work. Let's, he's the one doing this work. This is not born of, born of man. Amen. And uh, what does your organization need? Um, and, um, you know, for example, a lot of the Medicare will be very expensive. You've got uh, logistical issues bringing children over from Iraq or from, from Syria or through, through uh, Jordan into Israel. Um, and then also then obviously providing the medical costs as well, as well mm -hmm. as the, the care and, and the ministry uh, work as well, um, which is all important in this work. I want, to be, I want to be clear on this. Uh, I didn't come to talk to you and your, your viewers today to say, look at this wonderful work we're doing and uh, maybe you ought to pray for us and support us. Uh, we need to hand this work on. It needs to multiply because you know, the, the, the harvest is, is ripe and yet the laborers are, are few. And we, uh, we have never turned a child away for reasons of money or capacity and that's a miracle too. But we're at this place where, um, like any group, as it, as it grows, it has to start multiplying to be like the kingdom of God, which multiplies like, like yeast until the whole, the whole area is, is, uh, is affected. And um, we want to be a pioneer in the sense that we've seen how God can intervene in the Middle East. We've seen it in our weakness, and we don't have the resources, that if we'll step forward with faith, God responds. I want to call out the, uh, the followers of, of Jesus now to say, you could do the same thing. Uh, we, we'll be your servants to help equip you and show you the way and support with infrastructure, but we need groups of believers. To look at one of these children, you can go on our website, which is shevet.org, and, and you can look at the, uh, the kids that are waiting to come to Israel. And um, if the Lord touches you and says, step up, take ownership for one of those kids, um, share the story. I know we don't have the resources, but we have networks, we have friends, and we have neighbors. This is a wonderful way to get out into the, uh, into the church, the larger church, who don't understand Israel and say, look, um, we're not affirming Israel against her neighbors, we're working with Israel to redeem her neighbors. And a wonderful way to, to, to share the word of God concerning Israel and the Jewish people, to reach out to our Muslim neighbors and show the love of God to them. 
And uh, if, if we invite you to join us and make this work your work. And um, Jonathan, we're down to less than uh, five minutes of the program. Um, can you share with us how your, what the Lord is using you um, to bring about peace and reconciliation between Israel and her, her neighbours, mm -hmm. uh, once enemies. But, but surely the work that you, the Lord has called you to do is sowing seeds of peace and sowing seeds of love. Mm -hmm. I think um, as believers in the Word of God, we need to think carefully in light of the Scriptures, in light of the prophets. So where is all this really heading? Um, you know, there's streams of thoughts in the church uh, that say well, the world's going to get better and better until the millennium comes through our efforts <laughs> and peace is going to break out. Um, frankly, I don't see that in the prophets. I see the world getting worse and worse and we see it with our eyes. And conflict is, is growing in the world. Um, hatred of the Jewish people is growing in the world and in our home countries. Um, you know, I've heard representatives of the Jewish community right here in the, in the UK saying, we may have to leave this country. Unthinkable words you never would have thought. But people are starting to, to say, we're not feeling so safe or welcome here anymore. Um, and in the Middle East, I, I don't think through our work that uh, all the problems going to be solved. But I do believe our Father is saving many out of this judgment and conflict that's coming on the earth. And for our Muslim neighbors in particular in the Middle East, what will that look like? Let me share with you what I heard at Pentecost a few weeks ago in Jerusalem. Gathering of Jewish and Arabic believers, Jewish brother stands up and he says, I want to speak to our brothers, our Arab brothers. It's time for you to come home. Come back to the tents of our father Abraham. Islam is not your home. You belong with us. Come home to us. And I know the Muslim heart. I've lived and worked with them for decades now. That goes right, right to the heart. It touches that sore spot of, yeah, you were cast out, you weren't wanted, uh, you're second class. Uh, and the message of the New Testament it is all that division is gone. The death and resurrection of Jesus tore down the wall of separation. And uh, many, many of our Muslim brothers and sisters in the Middle East are going to come home to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And there's going to be peace on that personal and that spiritual level. And even you're starting to see, uh, you and I mentioned this uh, briefly before we started uh, the, this interview, that um, some of the immediately neighboring Arab countries are forming relationships with Israel more and more openly that uh, the political leaders are surprised and say, I never thought we would see this, but, it, but it's happening. Um, Things are changing, and uh, the things that we thought we knew about the Middle East are no longer true. And remember, you interviewed uh, um, uh, Musa oh, yeah. Hassan. Uh, yes. Muslims, when they come to faith in the God of Israel through the Bible, their whole heart changes towards the Jewish people, and they become their greatest friends and champions. It's, it's not, uh, this isn't a dream, this is reality. Yeah. And when our Jewish neighbors see Muslims starting to love and cherish them and support them, uh, think of the power that's going to be released in the Middle East through that. Absolutely. So it's a very, very special uh, ministry to, to be part of, um, uh, Jonathan. And, uh, you know, how important is it that our viewers get involved, not only through prayer, but also through, uh, you know, financial support, but also being willing to volunteer and to come along and, and, mm -hmm. and to help uh, your uh, organization? Those are very real very real options. Uh, we love to have volunteers from the nations come out, even for a week or two. And it enriches our community. It enriches the experience of these families. They come to Israel. We have a big house on the sea in Jaffa, uh, right where Peter had his vision about the, the good news going to all the nations. Uh, we're right there. And uh, we all live together. We're a community of faith. We begin every day with worship, prayer, and scripture. And the Muslim families come and live with us and uh, eat with us and pray with us and weep with us and we rejoice together. Uh, people can come and, and participate in that. And, um, but again, uh, we want groups that will take a child as their own and to organize the support and share his story through their own networks, not through ours. And I invite people to contact us about Fantastic. that. Uh, Jonathan, I just want to thank you so much for being my guest on today's Middle East Report. And thank you for bringing such a powerful message of uh, peace and reconciliation. And uh, we just pray that God will continue to strengthen you in the incredible work that you're doing, serving both Israel and her Arab neighbors. Glory to God for what he's doing in the Middle East. Amen.
And I just want to thank you for watching uh, today's uh, Middle East report. I think what we've seen today is uh, God's heart and his love, not only for Israel, but also for Israel's Arab neighbours and how through one, this wonderful ministry that the Lord is using so powerfully um, is having such a profound impact regarding peace and reconciliation in the Middle East. And we leave you with this remarkable song in tribute to the incredible work being carried out by Shevet Achim.